All right. In theory, we are live. And again, I apologize for all the rigmarole there. Um, there was a whole bunch of shit. Kurt Cummings, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I apologize for I don't know what the fuck was going on with uh, Streamlabs this morning. It did not want me to do the sermon. I thought long and hard about not doing the sermon. But here we are. We're going to do the fucking sermon. <laughs> it was your fault. <laughs> no, I, I I don't know what it is. I uh, I have been experiencing some extreme Streamlabs issues lately. and uh, But I'm glad you're here. It, it doesn't want the truth to come out. I don't even know what truth I'm necessarily giving to people. But it doesn't want it. None of it. So, per my pre-prepared remarks that were fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. That, that's what we're going with here. <laughs> so, it's Father's Day. I'm not going to go long today. My uh, family has plans for me because they're lovely people. And I adore them greatly. But we wanted to at least get a sermon on the board here and I wanted to talk a little bit about fathers I know worst father in the Bible there are many I am gonna focus on Abraham today for a few reasons mainly being that he has a whole song about father Abraham and so I feel like you know he's the father of all nations we, we refer to Abrahamic religions all of those things, I feel like, makes him the target for today. And I say target because, yeah, there, there's a little malice here, sure. Because I am a good father. I take a lot of pride in that. I love my kids. I work hard to make sure that their life can be better than mine was. And I take being a father very seriously. It's one of the few things in this world that I take seriously. And uh, Abraham, that guy, he's kind of a dickhead. And again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, editorializing this. I'm not adding conjecture. You just look at the text. Look at the text. This guy's a fucking dick. So we're going to get to that in just a minute. <laughs> yeah, he's a dong. Infinite dong. But, I would be remiss if we didn't bring back a little segment that people enjoyed from Season 1. It'll be our first segment here in Season 2. We're going to bring back the rule of the law today. So, let's talk about the law. As Sylvester Stallone would say, the law. We're going to talk about Leverite marriage. What is Leverite marriage? I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look. In Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verses 5 through 6, If brothers are living together, and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside of the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So what is Leverite marriage, you ask? Pretty simple. If you have a brother, I do. I'm assuming, I know Kurt does. Many people have brothers. You have a brother. And your brother were to die. But he's married. But he did not have children before he died. Specifically, he did not have a male child because we are in the super, super misogynistic Old Testament here. Well, who's going to take care of her? What's going to happen to all your brother's shit? What's going to happen to, you know, who's he going to leave all that to? It's your job via leave a right marriage to take your brother's wife and knock her up and to continue to knock her up mind you until she bears a son 
and that son will be considered your brother's firstborn son. That son will carry on your brother's name. It will inherit your brother's share. It will inherit your brother's things. As the firstborn son in ancient biblical custom received a double portion of the inheritance. So if you were a dad and you had a thousand camels and you had four kids. So when you died, each kid would be entitled to 250 camels, right? Wrong. Your oldest born son would be entitled to 500 camels. And then everybody else would have to divvy up the rest. Being the firstborn son was a big deal. And so not having one was an equally big deal. So by the duties of Leverite marriage, you would be responsible for providing your dead brother with an heir to carry on his name to inherit his shit. But see, there... In lies the conflict with this rule because you see there's also a little subline to the whole birthright thing and that is if your brother dies and he doesn't have a son and you bang his wife like a drum but do not produce a son, you get all your brother's shit. So there's not a whole lot of, shall we say, financial incentive to actually carry out Leverite marriage. There is the incentive for bloodline, even though that gets weird because it's technically your kid, but it's not actually your kid. Yeah, it's pretty fucked, Kurt. And that leads us to the story of Onan. I don't know if you guys know who Onan was, but uh, if you one of my favorite authors, I know some people have tried to say he's problematic. I don't want to fucking hear it. I will fight you. I love David Foster Wallace. I think his prose is some of the greatest prose ever written. He wrote a little book called Infinite Jest. It's incredibly long it is incredibly thick lots of people like to say they've read it very few people have actually read it. and in it he repeatedly bangs on a joke about onanism onanism is basically masturbation and the reason that it has the name onanism falls back on this bible story about Onan. The poor guy is in the Bible for like one verse, yet his name became synonymous with coitus interruptus. Why is that, you say? I'm glad you asked. Judah got a wife for Ur. We're in Genesis here, mind you. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and his name, her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. That is literally all we hear about this guy, Ur. Nobody fucking knows why. There are some Hebrew scholars that will tell you, do much more research than I'm willing to do on this asshole, that what it was, was he wouldn't knock his wife up because he was afraid of how it would change her looks. He thought his wife was hot. He was afraid if he banged her and she got pregnant, she would be less hot. So he didn't get her pregnant. And so God killed him over this. Not banging this chick is going to lead to another death momentarily here. Or not banging her properly. So then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. Leverite right marriage thing. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death also. 
So what we have here is apparently this guy, Er, won't knock his wife up because she's hot. And he doesn't want her to get prego. He, he's not looking for, you know, the pregnant body. He's really into her as she is. So God kills him. So then, Onan, it's his job to, to knock this chick up with a son so that she can inherit all of Er's shit. So this, this child can inherit it. And Onan, he's thinking to himself, you know, I would rather just have my brother's stuff. And uh, you know what? I'm okay with banging my brother's wife. She's a cutie. But I don't want to get her pregnant. Because then she gets all the shit that right now is mine. So he pulls out. God did not dig that and struck him down. Now, why are we talking about this? Because this is like a nonsensical fucking story. And I can hear you being like, Chad, we get that you like David Foster Wallace. And we get that you got the in-joke of his book. But seriously. Why are we talking about this? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk for a second. Let, let, let's get real. The reason we're talking about this is that passage, that one fucking insignificant little passage, three fucking verses that we just read, that is why the Catholic Church says you can't have birth control. I want you to let that sink in for just a moment. The entire crux of the Catholic Church's objection to birth control is right there. And, and, and it doesn't hold up under any scrutiny. So let's scrutinize for a moment, shall we? If you want to believe this story, and if you want to take this story as fact, and that's fine. I'll, let, I'll, I'll go, I'll work with you on that. Did God kill Onan because he was not impregnating his brother's wife every time he fucked her? Yeah, that's it, Kurt. That's it. And, and it's, again, like so many other things in life, the Catholic Church is missing the point of the story. The point of the story was that it was Onan's job to provide his brother with an heir because his brother had died. Even though we're going to overlook the part that his brother died because his brother didn't want to provide himself with an heir, apparently. But, yes, it was not that he didn't get her, pr that, that he came on the ground. That's not what God's mad about. God was mad that he was enjoying banging his brother's wife. Read the text there. It said, whenever he slept with his brother's wife. That doesn't make it sound like it was a one-time thing. That makes it sound like he was like, hey, I'm going to bang Tamar. She's hot, but I'm not going to get her pregnant because I want to keep the shit. This has nothing to do with birth control. God wasn't mad that he was fucking her and pulling out. God was mad that he was pulling out because the whole reason he was fucking her was to create children to carry on his brother's name. So he was basically, you could sort of look at that as rape if you want to be honest about it. He was supposed to sleep with her purely to create a child. And the minute a child is born, he really was supposed to like back off that shit. But instead, he was trying to have the best of both worlds. He was double dipping, if you will. You mean biblical figures were also pieces of shit? No way. Yes. And again, th that is the amazing part about this to me, is that somehow the Catholic Church took this one little bit of text, and were like, yep, condoms, God hates them, they're a mortal sin. No. No. It was this one specific incident. Stop taking isolated text and applying it to your entire life. It's fucking insane. So God does not care if you pull out. God does not care if you wear a condom. 
God cares if you fuck people with false impressions. False intentions. That's what he cares about. So you could honestly take this more as an indictment of, you know, don't lie to chicks to sleep with them. That's not okay. God is way more interested in that than if you blow your spunk in the sand instead of in her. It, it, it's the God's honest truth. I, I, I can't stress that enough. So please stop being idiots. On this Father's Day, use birth control. It's okay. There's plenty of fucking people in the world. We don't need more. So, please, let's stop dragging Onan's name through the mud here. Okay? Onan... Yeah, and there's plenty of people fucking. There's plenty of people fucking. There's gonna be plenty more people in the future. You don't need to add to that list. Wear a rubber. It's not gonna make God mad. I promise. So that was our rule of the law. And so now, let us move on to the main event today. We're going to talk about Father of the Year candidate. Abraham was not. Okay? He was not. Father Abraham, you know him. The father of nations. The father of all religions that are tax exempt at this point. This guy. He was a douche. And quite possibly the worst fucking example of a father in the Bible. He's literally terrible at being a dad. And yet that's what he's remembered for. Is being a dad. I take umbrage with it. And you should too. Let's dive in. In Genesis 15, 1 through 7. Yeah, we're going to get to that, Kurt. He was a dick before that. If you can imagine it, that was only strike two in this guy's I'm a terrible father portfolio. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Quick side note, he was Abram before he became Abraham, which it's a dumb pun, but you have to admit, it's kind of amazing that you add ham to the guy's name for a religion that forbids eating pork. Just saying. So the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? Side note, Eliezer of Damascus is kind of getting shit on here. Eliezer of Damascus was, by all accounts, Abraham's top servant, really good dude, and he is who stood to inherit all of Abraham's shit if Abraham doesn't have a kid. And it's worth noting that Abraham at this point is Bezos level rich. Supposedly because of his friendship with El. We're not at Yahweh at this point, we're at El. Just, just to clear that up. And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, now I, I love that part of the text. I feel like people gloss over that. He took him outside and said, this again gives us cause to believe that L was hanging out with Abram like personal, like one-on-one -on -one in human form. Like, he took him outside. People gloss right over that text. But I really feel like that kind of means, like, he walked them outside. You know, he was hanging out in Abram's tent. Which, you know, bears a question. Why did El need all the messengers he had if he could appear to people himself? And that's a valid question that I don't really have an answer for. But what also seems logical is that maybe Abraham was just hanging out with some guy that was saying a lot of crazy shit. And somebody wrote that crazy shit down and started a whole religion over it. Both are plausible. So he took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. 
Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Again, this here is basically the justification that Israel uses every time they bulldoze Palestinian settlements. This is where it goes back to that, uh, hey, God gave us this land. He gave it to Abraham. I'd like to poke a little hole in that theory and claim, you know, because you want to say that God gave the land to you. That's fine. He gave it to Abraham's descendants. Let's talk about how Abraham started pretty much every massive conflict that's happened in the 20th century involving Israelis and Arabs. Yeah, it's this guy's fault. I want you to think about that for a minute. All of the problems that Israelis and Arabs have, you can trace it back, if you want to believe the Bible, it is literally all Abraham's fault. Every bit of strife, every bad thing that has happened, every terrorist attack, every child that has perished, every single bit of discontent that has happened between the Israelis and the Arabs, you can all trace back to Abraham being a dipshit. What do I mean? Riff, that seems like a pretty heavy charge to level at someone. Okay. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all, Abram brought all those to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Good to know. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. And the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep. And a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possession. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. And in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. So, no, he's not winning a Nobel Peace Prize, Kurt. This is some interesting text because basically why, why I wanted you to read this is, again, we, we spend so much time talking about so many of the little quirks of the Hebrew people are considered things to set them apart, right? Things that differentiate them from the other religions and peoples of the time. This little thing, cutting animals in half, as weird as that fucking seems, that was a super common way to enter into a treaty with a person at the time. People of numerous religions at that time, if you and I were going to enter into a business deal, any kind of contract, one of the things we would do is we would cut an animal in half, and then you and I would hand in hand walk between the carcasses and by walking between that animal we would signify that we had you know that animal's blood sacrifice created a bond between you and i and i think it's really telling that l enters into that kind of contract with abram here he has abram do the contractual ritual that would have made sense to Abram at the time. It's almost like when you do silly things with your kids because it helps them under you know you understand them on their level. So you do silly things. Th that is kind of how this appears to be here is that L is allowing Abram to do this little ritual because he wants him to know that he's committed. And I think it's very interesting that L didn't come up with his own ritual. L didn't tell him to just believe him. L entered into a contract the way you did at the time. 
And so, while not as important to the story, I find it fascinating that L decided to talk on terms that Abram could understand. Hey, I'm going to enter a deal with you, and I'm going to make it a legally binding deal. So, Abram's done that now. At the time, Abram is like 80 years old at this point. And God is telling him, don't worry, dude. Totally, you're going to have a kid. Abram also, at this point, is a bit of an outlier in the time in that he only has one wife, Sarai, who would later become known as Sarah. That's his only wife. Not real common back then. Which makes the whole story kind of weird because, let's be honest, back then, progeny was everything. So the fact that he's been married to Sarah and she hasn't produced a son, usually you would just move on. But Abraham has stayed faithful to her, or at least the sanitized documents that we're reading would state. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. She's blaming God on this. I want you to know that. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai had said. So Abram, after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So yeah, Hagar sleeps with Abram, she gets pregnant, and according to this text, she starts to look at Sarai like a piece of shit now. Like, hey, look, getting pregnant, it's not that hard. Why can't you do it? That's kind of the text there. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Yeah. Remember the part where she, you know, it's literally like three sentences before, where she told him to sleep with her slave? so that they could produce offspring now that he did exactly what she said and she's pregnant this is an issue and she's upset you are responsible for the wrong i am suffering i put my slave in your arms and now that she is pregnant she despises me may the lord judge between you and me your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do whatever, do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated her, so she fled from her. Again, let's, before we get too into this, let's take a moment and, and, and think about that. So, Sarah decided unilaterally, according to the text, I, I be believe me, I am willing to, if you want to make an argument that this text has been, you know, put through the male gaze to make Sarah the bad guy, much like the Adam and Eve story, I'm willing to buy that. I'm willing to entertain that conversation. But the text that we have says that, that Sarah basically said, there's no way God is going to get me pregnant at my advanced age. He clearly meant for you to sleep with my slave. That's totally what God meant. And Abraham goes, all right, I'm in. He knocks the check up, as his wife told him to do, as was common practice at the time. She gets pregnant and uh, apparently doesn't enjoy being a pregnant slave. I can't imagine why. And so Sarah starts treating her like shit because she's mad. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they were even allowed to look at the Bible, much less write parts of it. But yeah, so then she starts treating Hagar so shitty. How shitty did she treat her? I'm glad you asked. She treated this woman so shitty that even pregnant, and alone, she fled into the desert because she just couldn't handle being around Sarai anymore. So Hagar flees into the desert 
And God comes to her. And he's like, yo, why'd you run away from Sarah? And she's like, um, because she's a giant bitch. And God's like, I get it. Um, you're going to have a son, by the way. And your son is going to be the father of a nation. Your, your descendants will be more numerous than the sand. He likes to tell people this, in case you haven't noticed. This is kind of Elf's thing. He's promising you a long progeny. It's kind of his M.O. He goes, but you got to go back to Sarah. Abraham will take care of you. Go back. You're going to die out here in the desert. So she goes back. And she has a son. And that son is named Ishmael. Which basically, in layman's terms, means he was put upon. Basically, it means guy who gets shit on. That's her son. And Sarah is all about this. Sarah is all about it. She basically raises him as her own. Even though Hagar is still in the picture, she's basically reduced... Again, she's a slave. That, that part didn't change. Just because she had a kid with Abram. So she's got this kid. Abram is raising him as his own. And about 13 years later, Sarah gets pregnant. And she has Isaac. At this point, Sarah really despises Ishmael. Because, as you remember what we talked about in the first segment, the firstborn son gets a double portion of the inheritance. And she sees that Ishmael is going to get the double inheritance, not Isaac, her son, because Ishmael is Abram's first son. And again, this is all her doing, by the way. So this is her fault. So, it's in the book, so we have to acknowledge it. But basically, she claims that at one point, she saw Ishmael making fun of Isaac. Now, I don't know how many of you have younger siblings, but I do. And if making fun of your younger siblings is a banishable offense, I would say we would have all been banished. But that's what Ishmael does. And I think it's kind of telling that even in the text they mention that when she catches Ishmael making fun of Isaac, what she's really mad about, it says it right there in the text, is that he is going to inherit the double portion. So she goes to... Abraham and says get fucking rid of them Hagar Ishmael they're gone I don't want them anymore because now that she has her own kid her stepkid is worthless to her real winner this Sarah real winner so in true good human fashion she banishes her 13 year old stepson and his mother into the desert says fuck off Ishmael would go on to be the father of all Arabs. All Arabs trace their lineage to Ishmael. Yeah, Isaac's supposed to get the shitty piece of chicken. Sarah had something to say about that. But all, just as all Jews trace their lineage all the way back to Isaac, all Arabs trace their lineage all the way back to Ishmael. Ishmael versus Isaac. The entire thing. All Arab Jewish contention. It goes back to right here. This is where it all started. If you want to go by the books. So yeah. Kind of a big deal. And again, 100% Abraham's fault. I mean, look at the cop-out at the end of this. It drives me insane. Do with her. Your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. This is when she was pregnant. 
He literally was like, I don't fucking care. Do whatever you want. He cared so little about the woman pregnant with his son that he was willing to keep the harpy he lived with happy. Even though she told him to knock this girl up. That he would banish her to the desert. She came back. And then 13 years later, he kicks her out again with her son. Because, again, all he's actually worried about is keeping this shrill harpy Sarah happy. And so, due to that, it really does, doesn't it? Thousands of years of war, we can blame on these two assholes. Every time the Israeli, Palestinian, or any other Arab conflict flares up, Think back to these two idiots. It's all on them. It's all their fault. But this is not the pinnacle of Abraham being a shitty dad. Sure, he abandoned his firstborn son because he had another one with a different woman. That's not even the shittiest thing he did as a dad. That's what a dickhead this guy is. So, uh, yeah. You know what story comes next. I don't need to tell you what story comes next. You know that story. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Notice he's Abraham now. He's Jewish, so he has Ham. It doesn't make sense. I didn't write the book. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, Your only son. Did did you read that? El has also dismissed Ishmael as not even being a real human being. You wonder why the guy... Trust me, they're allowed to be upset. Arabs have literally been shit on since this book was written. And go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded up his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. He had cut enough wood for the burnt offering. He set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Notice how long it took to get there. How long did it take to get there? Three days. We love that number here. And, uh, you know, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Isaac's got to carry the wood. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar atop of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now that I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your son from me, your only son. Like, can we, can we, just take a minute there. I'm sure we all know this story. But just in case it was, I'm going to give you a son. I finally gave you one. You should go kill him. Oh, wait, you're willing to do that? Cool. I just wanted to see if you were willing to do it. That is not cool on a level that I I, I can't even begin to explain how not fucking cool that is. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Mika is also a mother. She has born sons to your brother, Nahor, who is the firstborn. Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, father of Aram, Kesed, Hezo, Pidash, Jiblaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. 
Milcah bore these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Ramah, also had sons Teba, Gana, Tahash, and Makah. This is the text that is immediately after the story of Abraham nearly killing Isaac. It seems really weird. Like, you have this big dramatic story of Abraham going to slaughter his son because God told him to, and then God stops him. Or did he? There are many people that actually think that this was a retcon and that Abraham totally did sacrifice Isaac and that ch child sacrifice of course fell out of favor so the story was retconned into the whole ram in the bushes thing why why do some people think that well if you see the part i haven't read there ruma also had sons teba ganam tanash and makah none of those people are ever mentioned again in the bible never but if you understand the actual hebrew and the ancient text that was written rima means see what teva slaughtering or slaughtered gaham is the flame or burning tanash was skin if you remember the unicorn skin that we talked about that covered the tabernacle last week or it might have been two weeks ago yeah that's that same word and makah is blown or crushed there's a hint here that basically he did sacrifice isaac and that sacrificing isaac was the blood payment for all of the descendants that he would then get yeah <laughs> this is the retcon this is the toned down version this is the toned down version so yeah there are a lot of scholars that believe that abraham totally did kill isaac there are other scholars that believe that he didn't actually kill him but that he put the wood on the altar and that it burned Isaac up, that God stopped him from slitting Isaac's throat, but that Isaac burned to death on the altar, which is actually worse. Somehow, you take this terrible story, and it gets worse. But there, there's good reason to believe that he did kill Isaac, and here's why. The whole story of Abraham and Isaac here is often believed to be a parallel to the story of Christ. God was, when Christ was crucified, he was in the tomb for three days. How long did it take Abraham and Isaac to get to Mount Moriah? Three days. Um, if he does not ever mention again speaking to Abraham. In fact, the text goes on to talk about Abraham going back home. But they never mention him and Isaac talking again. Now, maybe Isaac just never spoke to him again because he was a fucking psycho that was going to stab him to death because his space buddy told him to. Or maybe he killed him. We don't know. Isaac is mentioned later as the father of, you know, Jacob and Esau. But could have been another Isaac. This Isaac might have got the, you know... But look at the parallels. So three days in the tomb, three days to get to Mount Moriah. Jesus famously carried his cross. Isaac carried the wood for the, the thing. Jesus was seen as a sacrifice for all of us. Isaac is kind of the analog here. He is a sacrifice for all of the descendants that Abraham will eventually have. So it kind of seems weird that the, the ram gets substituted. A lot of people try to claim that that is the true parallel, that we deserve to be sacrificed for our sins, but that God provided his son, the lamb of God, to be sacrificed. 
And so, much like he provided Abraham with a ram, which is also A, not a lamb, which would make the sacrifice not okay, because it was supposed to be, you know, a new lamb, not a ram, because it specifically says in the text that the ram was caught in the thicket by its horns. So, God was cool with him after he didn't kill his kid, it was totally okay to use a non-clean sacrifice because, yeah, it doesn't really fit, does it? He was pretty specific about the sacrifices. Remember what happened to, you know, Abinabab and Nahub, you know, they got the space laser. He's real specific about those sacrifices, except apparently in this case. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking Abraham killed that kid. And even if he didn't, he was willing to. Which 100% makes him the worst father ever, in my opinion. So, yeah. I mean, literally, if you want to be a better person than Abraham, don't knock up your wife's friends and then abandon the kid. And don't attempt to murder your children. If you can do those two things, you are a better father than Abraham. That kid died, Kurt. That kid died. Yeah. It, it, it makes too much sense that that kid died. Like I said, it, it, they don't mention the kid and Abraham ever talking again. And, uh, it's fucked up. So, on this Father's Day... I challenge you to be better than Abraham. Because it's not really, it's literally the lowest bar I could put before you on a Sunday sermon. But I'm going to put that incredibly low bar before you. And ask that you be better than him. You can look at this story and there are a lot of things you could take from it. That he should have just had faith in God the whole time. And then he wouldn't have created the Arabs. Oh, that's kind of a shitty message too. That the Arab people are an accident. And that their very existence offends God. That's the text here. So, the fact that Arabs tolerate Judaism and they tolerate the belief system it, it's it's kind of fucked up because this text literally calls them accidental bastards and I know some wonderful Arab people so I don't buy that a bit and so maybe just maybe we should put aside these Bedouin fairy tales and look at our fellow man as a man and treat them with dignity and respect and humanity and what we should also totally not do is stab children and light them on fire I can't believe I had to say that yeah yeah it's kind of fucked up right I, I like to wonder, when he was taking Isaac up there, did he know where Ishmael was? And was he thinking, like, well, if I kill this kid up here, at least Ishmael's still out there somewhere. Does he know where Ishmael is? We're, we're never told. Ishmael's never mentioned again. I'd like to I like to wonder. Like, was he up there like, hey, you know what? I'm going to kill this kid because the space dude told me to. It's all right. I got Ishmael back there. And maybe he did kill that kid. And if he did, then could the entire difference between Israelis and Arabs actually be a retcon in itself? And that actually they're all descendants of the same guy, Ishmael, and that they're all related, and that all of their fighting is completely fucking stupid? I'm going to leave you with that heavy thought today. And implore you to be better than Abraham. It is the lowest bar I can set. 
Yeah, signs point to yes. I'm thinking that maybe they should all stop fighting over that sand. And just put these fairy tales to rest and get along. But I'm just a guy saying stuff that they wrote in their book. It seems pretty simple when you take the dogma out of it and analyze it from an intellectual point of view that everyone is fighting about nothing. So, I hope you've enjoyed this this week. I hope you have a wonderful Father's Day. Tell your dad you love him. Because if you're here today, it proves he's a better father than Abraham. So, call your dad. Tell him thanks for not listening to a crazy space person and stabbing you to death and lighting you on fire. <laughs> Also, if you're a dad and a crazy space voice tells you to go kill your kid, you tell that space voice to go fuck itself. All right. Thank you for being here. It means the world to me. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Have a good one. Go be better than Abraham. It's really not that hard.